And um, let's open with a word of prayer, everybody. And then we will turn it over to Terry and she can have her way with us. So, <laughs> and we'd ask you to mute if you can, please. Loving God, thank you for this opportunity that we have to meet together. Thank you for the spirit of collegiality and unity and creativity that you have gifted to the church. We are so grateful for all of our leaders and especially this evening for uh, our general minister and president who has come out of some family time to be with us this evening. We are grateful for her presence with us and we look forward to what she has to say. We ask that you would bless, continue to bless her ministry um, not only with us, but the entire church, give her moments of rest and renewal. And may everything that happens this evening bring glory to you. And may we all be a blessing to your people everywhere. We ask this in your name and by your grace. Amen. Amen. So, Terry, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, I want to thank you again for giving me the flexibility I normally I'm in my nice home office with my cool little backdrop, you know, with the chalice and everything. So I apologize for being in the car. Um, many of you may not know, uh, last year in September, I lost my mother. Um, and my mother was the oldest of five sisters, uh, five girls. And so the next oldest uh, had a birthday. And so um, my other aunts and cousins and everybody came in uh, to Indy where she lives and uh, this was just uh, a really bittersweet kind of celebration because um, my mom's sisters are all still missing her. She was like their second mom because she was the oldest sister. So thank you for your flexibility. And uh, it's good to be with you. I remember uh, what was it maybe four years ago, we were in Guelph and I was there for uh, in person uh, for your regional assembly there and really enjoyed uh, being in Canada uh, these past couple of uh well, past couple of months, I've participated pretty regularly uh, in the um, general council sessions of the United Church of Canada. Um, when I was there before, we had not yet officially voted to be full communion partners with the United Church, but um, we are now. And so I've been very active uh, in those sessions, which kind of began in January and just ended um, a couple of weeks ago with the installation of the first indigenous moderator uh, Reverend Dr. Carmen Lansdowne. So I'm looking forward uh, for the disciples to continue and, and really strengthen and make more progress on that relationship. We now have a um, agreement on mutual recognition of clergy, which your regional minister, Jen Garbin, was on that committee as we worked through um, those, um, those rules and that agreement, which was based uh, heavily on the agreement that the United Church of Canada has with the United Church of Christ in the U.S. So uh, lots, lots going on. Um, I wanted to share tonight about two really important things that I've been talking about uh, around the church. And um, as you all know, and as Jen um, is so diligent in reminding us with great love, but with great persistence, uh, that Canada is a distinct and different cultural context uh, from the US. And um, Canada, um, and I'm, I'm explaining this everywhere I go. I, I don't know how many times I said this in discussion groups uh, during the United Churches General Council, that in Canada, um, the church, the disciples of Christ in Canada are not just a region of our wider church, um, but they are, um, they are, um, a separate and distinct and nationally recognized entity in Canada. So Canada, uh, Jen is a signatory to that full communion agreement, just as I am as the general minister and president and as um, um, the folks in uh, the United Church of Canada are. But two things I wanted uh, to share. One is called the, the Covenant Project. The Covenant Project is something that we have been uh, working on really for the past three years. The Governance Committee of the General Board uh, has had two different retreats since September of 2019, uh, one in person and another virtual. Um, the question that's been before us uh, came, what lessons did we learn from the Mission First Project, which attended, uh, intended rather to try to find a way to determine mission priorities for the full church, but also to look at how the church was structured and how uh, the general board in particular is structured and how the church makes, um, uh, a, hold on just a second, I've got to 
me see if I can do this. Can I put you on hold just a second? Hold on. Okay, there we go. I just got a, a text from the aunt who just turned 80 years old. I was trying to make sure she was okay. She's fine. <laughs> I'm sorry for the interruption. Um, the Covenant Project um, is, is really about being a more nimble church, being a more relevant church, and looking at the, the structures and processes that govern how we make decisions. Currently, our General Assembly is held, as you know, every two years. Um, I hope that as many of you as can will be able to join us in Louisville, Kentucky um, in July of 2023. Um, but the General Assembly um, often has difficulty with making decisions around issues that are perhaps more controversial. Um, there are a lot of things in our design, our governing document that uh, refer things to the General Assembly for which it is not well prepared to make decisions. Um, the general board is comprised of um, one representative from each of the regions, one representative from each of the general ministries, and then a small number of at-large folks. Um, those folks currently have like two-year terms. They're not able to, they meet once a year. Uh, I can't imagine us getting anywhere near uh, close to what we've been able to accomplish with the Covenant Project if we, this committee had only met once a year. Um, when you go to General Assembly, you've got one group of people um, in one year, two years later, we have a completely different group of people. Uh, resolutions come over the wall at General Board. Um, they have a chance to discuss them in maybe uh, two days of, you know, a couple of hours each conversation. And then those get out to the church and the church might have four or five months um, opportunity to even try to understand what's being put forth in a resolution. And then we get to the floor and we're not always um, <laughs> prepared or, or educated or aware of what the real intent is of the resolution. And so in recent years, if you've been to General Assembly, we have fewer and fewer people coming to the red mics. You know, we have green mics if you're for the resolution, red mics if you're against, yellow if you just kind of want to make a comment or raise a question. And so the debate on the floor is, you know, there's, there's something to be said for civil debate, we're all for that, but no debate is, is probably problematic in its own kind of way. So the recommendations that are being made by the Covenant Project, and again, as the Governance Committee was meeting, one of the things that we thought was really important um, was that we ground this theologically in an understanding of ourselves as a Covenant Church. Uh, the GMP doesn't have a magic gavel that I pound and everything just happens. Regional Minister doesn't have that kind of gavel either. And yet across our 31 regions and our 14 general ministries, there's still um, a lot of work that we have to do uh, to make things happen. And sometimes the way in which we make these decisions makes it uh, much more difficult uh, to learn and discuss. So here's the recommendation. Um, number one, the General Assembly would be held every um, three years instead of every two. A lot of people have been asking for that. Um, it, it feels like once one General Assembly is over, it's time to get ready for the next one. It can be a, an expensive thing to attend a General Assembly. Our numbers are such that uh, we're almost too big to just be like in one hotel. We, we're too big to do that. We don't really need an arena. Um, so in Louisville, we're going to be sort of in a convention center that I think will serve us well, but it's still an expensive proposition. The Office of General Minister and President bears all the financial risk. So if we don't get enough people to register for General Assembly, that means you don't make all of the hotel and food thing, all the things that you have when you, uh, when you uh, reserve that kind of space. Um, so it's an expensive proposition and we want to make it more accessible. The way to make it more accessible, both in terms of people being at General Assembly and in terms of people uh, getting to learn more about the decisions that are being made, 
is the proposal asked for three representatives from each congregation who would on those off years gather virtually to learn and discuss and put issues on the docket um, that would be discussed and talked about across the whole church. Uh, the results of those conversations would be sent to the general board, um, collating them almost in the way the general, uh, United Church of Canada handles their general council. They have what they call a facilitation team that's always gathering information from their discussion groups and feeding it back to the body to say, is this what you really said? Is this what you meant? Are we even ready to make a decision? So if you can imagine being in person, say in July of 23, and then um, in a three-year time cycle, if there are um, issues or concerns that people want to get on the agenda, you would just have a way to kind of put that on the docket, uh, have lots of regional meetings or local meetings. Um, it's not like nine, if everybody has three delegates, that would be 9,000 people, uh, a little more than 9,000 people because we have about 3,200 congregations. Um, 9,000 people are not necessarily going to need to be on a Zoom at the same time, but there might be uh, within a space of time um, gatherings that might be held because your church is like a, a, a satellite Zoom for lots of folks to participate in a wider conversation. And there's a way for you to feed the, the output and the feedback from your communicate from your discussion um, to the wider church. And we can get a greater sense of what matters to people, what people are thinking about things. In essence, the General Assembly, if you can imagine, would almost always be in session or be able to be called into session. Uh, the General Board would become more of a working board, uh, slightly smaller, but instead of just having geographic representation, there would be a more open or at-large feel. So instead of being the Senator from Guelph, for example, you serve the church on the General Board as a member of the General Board um, bringing your own perspective, bringing your own identities, bringing your own geographical um, location and perspective and cultural perspective with you, but you're not just accountable to your region or to where you came from. You've been chosen by a general nominating process that invites the whole church to put forth names and nomination. Those people are vetted, but you are there to represent and work for the whole church. This would allow us, like right now, if we have 31 plus 14 um, that's 45 people uh, out of a voting uh, of 60 or so that are just sent to us. We have no control over the diversity of that group. They're just sent to us. And that could often be a problem. And it's something that we can't fix just by um, trying to fill certain slots in the at-large uh, membership that we uh, are allowed to choose through the general nominating committee. That conversation then becomes, oh, but we need a person from Canada and it would be good if we had it, we need a younger person. So is it a younger person from Canada? Is it an older person from Canada? Is there an indigenous person from Canada? And then we get really limited as to how we fill these slots as opposed to saying, let's look widely across the church and let the whole church put forth names and ideas for, for the entire membership of the general board. There would be a committee on a mission to help us hear from the whole church about mission priorities, a finance committee to help think about funding as well as a governance uh, committee um, that helps us make sure that the rules and the processes that we have in place continue to work for us. And then an executive committee, which would function like our administrative committee does today. And that committee also serves part of the time as the board for the Office of General Minister and President. So three delegates from each congregation meeting in these off years to talk about a great number of things. And if there needs to be a decision made, in between generals, uh, the in-person meeting, the general board would have the authority to call the general assembly into session and we would be using technology to allow votes to take place and to allow these delegates to weigh in on matters that can't wait until the next in-person assembly. Uh, a great way to kick off an exploration of an issue or an idea. Uh, one of the things I was really, uh, really appreciated about the United Church of Canada's General Council is that they had, and this was their first time doing this all virtually, they had listening sessions where the person who presented a resolution was just to, there to answer your questions. And you could ask clarifying questions, but you did not, um, it wasn't the time to argue or debate or um, you know, offer your opinion. The idea was ask clarifying questions. And then there were discussion groups where you could debate 
and, and that information was shared more broadly with the church. And then they had decision sessions. I think that model will work really well for us uh, because we'll have the ability to do this all virtually and we'll have the ability for people really to learn and discuss uh, in a more consistent and timely way. And um, you won't just have four or five months to, to um, vote on something before it gets to the General Assembly floor. Um, so the, the Covenant Project, there is a curriculum called the Covenant uh, Conversation Curriculum, which you can find on disciples.org. It's completely online. There's no cost for it. It's a series of videos and study guides that are designed to help us think about this theological understanding of covenant between the various expressions of the church, um, between congregations and the whole church, between congregations and regions, and uh, just across the life of the church, how we understand covenant as opposed to contract, and theologically, what it means in terms of how we make decisions, the grace that we give each other. The other theological understanding I think that's really important is that the way we do general board and general assembly has been the same, not just 1969. <laughs> it's been the same since before then. Uh, what the design really did was to take the structures that were already in place. Instead of uh, area associations, we now call them regions. Instead of area secretaries, we call them regional ministers. And the power and how those things are chosen have been the same for much longer than 50 years since the design. And that structure was built for a time when instantaneous communication was not possible, when power structures were still very concentrated. And I see this process as a way to really dismantle some systems and processes that have been um, in place and have limited people's access to not just decision-making, but to ongoing conversation across the life of the church. There's no reason why we can't use technology that's available to us. And there's no reason why we can't open up this process uh, across the life of the church. So for me, there are there, there's some practical process and organizational kind of uh, mandates that I think are important here, but more importantly, this means that there's an even greater, ac greater access, not just to the in-person event, but greater access to conversation and getting your voice, getting your thoughts and ideas into the mix before decisions are made. But the only person who might represent Canada would not just be the regional minister and a regional representative. All of your congregations could participate um, by having three delegates. Um, on in ongoing conversations. And then that in-person event becomes, um, it can become, it's a family reunion now we call it, but it becomes something different because we've spent so much more time together before we even get there. We're prepared uh, to think about the ways in which we make decisions and what we're making decisions about. And we will have learned what's really important and what's timely that we might have needed to act before. So General Assembly perpetually in session using virtual technology to catch up, to, to connect us all, three uh, delegates from each congregation and a church-wide process for choosing who's on the general board, still maintaining uh, the diversity that we wanna see in the church, still ensuring that we have a greater um, geographic uh, representation, not just in one regional rep, but uh, a broader sense of, of who should be at the table uh, representing the whole church. So that's the covenant project. I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. I don't know how much time. Tell me if I'm going over, Jen. No, you're good. We have about an, another half hour or as much time as you uh, okay. set aside okay. about an hour. So that's exactly half okay. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions? If you have a question, raise your hand so you pop up to the top of the screen for us, please. Or even I see a note page. from somebody saying that they've been using the um, the covenant curriculum, so that's awesome. Yes, we did it as a region uh, over the last two weeks. We held all we held four Great. sessions uh, as a as okay. a region. So, yeah. Great. Are there any questions? Oh, thank you, Rachel. Yeah. Any questions on on that? I, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say. I I um I did attend one of the town hall meetings that uh, that was uh, oh, scheduled that came through the um 
I guess that uh, when you subscribe to the disciples um, page there, this, I've, yeah. I've subscribed all the leaders at our church, so they have no choice but to see those come through their their email. Uh, but what I what I so appreciate about this is it also allows us to know what's happening on both sides of the border. You know, I think that yes. uh, mm -hmm. having those conversations and feeling connected. So I'm uh, I'm in Windsor, so I'm in a border city. Uh, and so being able to connect with larger church across that border, I think, is a, a great opportunity. So I, I think this is very exciting. Excellent. Um, I, th I think the, um, the point that you were making, uh, let's see, the point that you were making there, is it Jonathan? Am I seeing? Um, Yes, ma'am. First of all, I'm I'm so excited that you signed up all your leaders, yay, uh, for the newsletters. Everybody can go to disciples.org, and there are, um, you probably can't miss the sign up because I think there are sliders on that page that show up pretty regularly. There's a there are four different newsletters that we have. One is called Disciples News Service. It comes out every Wednesday and it shares important information about what's happening across the life of the church. Um, including things that are happening in different regions and news from the general ministries. Um, there's one called Dear Disciples, which is my weekly newsletter. Sometimes it's a video, sometimes it's a written piece. Usually it's a video more recently. Um, there's something called Disciples um, Together, which is for pastors and chaplains, clergy and chaplains. And then there's one called um, Dis Justice Ministries, which is um, a vehicle that all of our justice ministries can use to get information out. So there are more town halls if you're interested about uh, learning more about the Covenant Project. Through the end of September, there was just a note out there, we're adding more sessions. We've had at least 50 people on each of these town halls and we're doing at least one a week. Um, they were scheduled toward the end of September and I think they've added some uh, across the next uh, five or six weeks. So um, go to disciples.org and look for a Covenant Project and there is a uh, schedule there. There's also an FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions, where they get into a little bit more detail uh, about how, uh, what's part of this proposal. We realize that we can't just flip the switch in July of 2023 and all this goes into action. So there's going to be uh, probably a two-year uh, ramping up where we'll need to do all the, you know, the necessary work of standing rules and all that good sort of stuff for the general board and general assembly. But um, I, I'm hearing um, a lot of um, excitement about it because as you say, Jonathan, both sides of the border um, and even across the US, right? Uh, California is not Alabama. <laughs> uh, there's such great diversity in, in the various states in the US and, um, there's certainly a, a distinct cultural context in Canada. Um, just across that border between Michigan and Canada, right? Or Minnesota and Canada or Washington State and Canada, all across that, that US Canadian border, life is different depending upon where you are along that continuum. Um, and, and I think this will just help us as a whole church. Uh, lots of borders, right? Gender, race, um, political persuasion, you guys have probably been um, watching with horror the political environment in the U.S. Uh, trust me, those of us who live in the U.S. are just as horrified, most of us, but there's great disagreement about what's going on. Huge political divisions in the U.S. And we see that, unfortunately, sometimes bleed over into the um, concerns that we have as a church. Um, and so that covenant idea is that we've got to learn to, we've got to build the capacity to listen to one another. The unity that we proclaim that's so important as a church um, can't be just unity because we just don't talk about the hard stuff, right? It can't be that we just don't talk about things that we disagree about because some of the most important things that we do as church are things about which we may disagree. Um, so building capacity to have those conversations is part of what we hope will happen with these um, congregational delegates meeting on a more regular basis. The second big piece that I wanted to talk about is called um, the Church Narrative Project. This project came out of uh, one of my own personal goals that I set for myself. 
was to explore the church's understanding of itself as a pro-reconciling anti-racist church and ask ourselves a hard question, if the reconciliation ministry is still the right way to do that work, and how do we help the church live into that beyond just requiring, requiring clergy to do anti-racism training every three years? And are there other issues that impact who we are and how we can um, um, work together as church amidst so many differences? The Church Narrative Project is uh, being led right now by the Reverend Yvonne Gilmore, who is the interim uh, administrative secretary of the National Convocation, which is the fellowship of African-American disciples. Um, and I asked her to lead this just because she is also one of our uh, lead uh, anti-racism trainers across the life of the church. But this is not anti-racism training. If you think about, um, who the church is in the U.S. and, and even in Canada. Uh, one of the things I hope we can learn from um, our Canadian disciples as well as the uh, United Church of Canada is in the U.S. race is its own issue. Canada as a country has done a much better job exploring and uh, doing truth telling around um, the issues of indigenous justice that the U.S. is really just way behind. Um, in Canada, talking about race, as I've learned from my friends, the United Church of Canada can often be something that's just considered to be impolite, although they're making strides in that. But I will paint a, a sort of the unspoken narrative of our church, um, and it's one into which we all play, whether we realize it or not. And that is that this is a predominantly white denomination that has made room at its table for other groups who are not white, be they in the U.S. or Canada. Um, we tend to, we're a very um, American, United Statesian centric church still. And that's something that we struggle with in terms of our relationship with all of you. Um, so even if we tell the story of Canada and the role of Canadian disciples, or we tell the story of African American or Hispanic or Asian Pacific Islander disciples, even if we plug in the missing holes and the missing stories, um, we, if we still have this unspoken narrative that we're a predominantly white church that owns the table has just made room, uh, we, we are still not getting beyond um, some of the power structures that, that we need to dismantle. And we're still not telling the truth to ourselves about who we are, and even more importantly, about who we want to be. The Church Narrative Project is starting uh, this month with um, the Central Rocky Mountain region, uh, which is Colorado, Utah, and um, part of Idaho. Having conversations with um, our consultant, Dr. David Anderson Hooker, who is a conflict management consultant, as well as a diversity and um, uh, anti-racism consultant. And his work really is on helping people understand the difference between narrative and story. You and I each have a story about who we are in the life of this church. And sometimes, even though our stories are there and we tell them, if we don't recognize that there's this unwritten narrative that keeps the power balances just the same, we have to write a new narrative together that talks about a shared future that we wanna have as a whole church. And we all have to participate in that. So group by group, um, in some cases that'll be regions. In some cases, uh, our general ministries are contributing to these conversations. So there may be some ad hoc groups that develop across regional and geographic borders um, so that we can have some facilitated conversations. Some of these meetings will be in person. Some of them will be uh, virtual to begin to tell the story of who we want the disciples to be moving forward. What's the narrative into which we all want to live? And what are the things um, that we want um, the wider world to know and understand about who we are as disciples? Um, and we can't get to that new narrative unless we tell the truth about the stories that we're not telling and the unspoken narrative into which we're living now. So you'll hear information about the Church Narrative Project. Uh, it's sort of, um, Yvonne uses the reverse um, musical chairs analogy. Instead of taking away chairs with each round, we're starting with a few folks and then we're adding chairs with each round. So you'll hear more and more about it um, we realize actually that not every region can, can afford to host and do one on its own. So we're going to be making opportunities 
for smaller regions to participate in other sessions um, with help from funding uh, from some of our larger regions and from our general ministries uh, so that we can make it all accessible. So we'll be doing at least four of these between now and the end of the year, reassessing at the end of the year. And then David Anderson Hooker is actually gonna be um, part of General Assembly uh, during the Monday night worship. Um, I've given him the opportunity to say, I just want you to help talk to the church about what will, you know, we'll have more groups that will have taken place uh, from January through July. Um, and hopefully we'll have more of this sort of methodology and way of looking at this issue disseminated throughout the church. And David will either preach or perhaps even have a panel uh, talking about um, what he calls transforming community conferencing getting at the real narrative into which we all live and an understanding of, of us writing a new narrative to say, who do we want to be? What, what's, what is the narrative that we want all of our stories to push uh, in a new direction? What are the kinds of things that no matter what the differences across our church and across our congregations, what are the things and the ways of being that we think are important so that people will understand who we really are as disciples of Christ? So I'm really excited about this. And I think just this skill building and capacity for conversation is really going to help us in this new model for making decisions as part of general board and general assembly as well. So these, everywhere I go, I'm trying to connect the dots between these two larger uh, projects and um, just really uh, hearing a lot of excitement for both of them across the life of the church and realizing I'm not the only one who, who can tell the story and I shouldn't be the only one excited about it. Um, our moderator team, regional ministers, um, we take a poll each one of our uh, town halls about the covenant project to say, does this excite you? Does this make sense? Are you concerned? What are your questions? And we're taking all the questions and feedback. We'll be sharing them with the governance committee and then the governance committee will be reporting to our administrative committee, which is the executive um, committee of the general board and that will happen at the end of October and then we're going to be ready with the resolution that will go to general board in April uh, and then after the general board in April we're going to have another round of these town halls to come back to the church and say okay before <laughs> between April and July we want to hear one more time give you an opportunity to hear what some of the greater details are and before we vote uh, give you another round of opportunities to really learn what we're talking about so that when you get to General Assembly, you're going to be ready to make uh, some important decisions. So uh, I'll stop there and, and see if there are any questions about the church narrative project. And, and hopefully you, you see the connections I'm trying to draw between building the capacity to have conversations about hard stuff um, and changing some of the processes that we use uh, to, to change our, our decision making. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, questions for Terry or comments? Yeah, thank you, Rachel, for putting the link there um, for the, the uh, newsletter sign up. Uh, and of course, uh, we have a new communications director in the Office of General Minister and President, Kara Gilger. Um, and she's been full-time in that role since uh, January. She was previously working as a contractor. Um, and so you'll see a lot of changes in some of our social media, uh, the, the graphics, like there's a um, Imagine More sermon series. Uh, we used a, a group called the Salt Project, who are actually a disciple of clergy and her husband, um, who helped us do a great little video. And there are some sermon outlines that a Reverend Lee Hall Moses, who is the chief of staff of my office, and also a disciples pastor, um, wrote some clergy, uh, some sermon outlines and some other resources for clergy to use. Uh, you know, we've been talking about imagine with me and imagine who we must be as a new church in a new world. Um, so Kara has been doing a great job in helping us coordinate uh, these town halls, but also get these newsletters going um, so that, you know, Jen can't be the only way you learn about what's happening in the wider church. I mean, Jen has a lot of important work to do um, and it, it, it makes her life easier the more you all know <laughs> about, what's going, about what's going on. So, so thanks to Jonathan for that initiative of getting folks signed up and spread the word about that. We're really trying to be sure that people understand that those emails and then all of our social media platforms 
that some people aren't on social, we get that. Some people would uh, are much better served by an email, but uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, we're even on LinkedIn now. Um, so look for Christian Church Disciples of Christ. I have a public page, Reverend Terry Hord Owens, and I have a personal page that has a limit of like 5,000, but we try to keep a lot of things on the Terry Hort Owens page, including prayer every Wednesday when I'm in town um, at noon Eastern. So lots, lots of ways to keep in touch. And I think what this model is saying is that we all have to take responsibility for, for learning and discussing and, and speaking up about the things that matter and, and making a contribution to, to the future of our church in that way. Anything that concerns you, if you don't have questions, because I also want to know if you're like, oh my God, what in the world are they doing? That makes no sense to me at all. That's, that's a valid concern. And if that's the way you feel, I would love to know. <laughs> Sarah says in the chat, this is the church I want to be a part of. And Rachel says, what good and important work. Very exciting indeed. Oh, Agreed. excellent. Excellent. Joe. You know, Sorry, I have Sorry, a sermon. I'm... Yeah. Sure, go ahead. I have a I have a question. Um, the anti-racism training, often there was such resistance to it. It sounds to mm -hmm. me like this narrative approach uh, will be a way in that uh, that the other approach, which dealt with so much with personal story, that that those of us who were white uh, hated to admit our own racism that this may be a way mm -hmm. into that that's that's more productive. Yeah. Is, is that what you're I, finding? I, that is definitely what we're finding. And I think it's giving, it's a more contextual piece. I think that we understand lots of history, even about um, the history of the development of, of Western Christianity, you know, things like the doctrine of discovery um, that, these, these narratives that we've been living into and trying to do sort of retroactive uh, addressing of things, right? Without really understanding what, what under what narrative a, a lot of this injustice was created and justified. Um, so the doctrine of discovery didn't just hurt black people, it hurt indigenous people. It, it's, it's hurt any non-Christian person really around the world because wherever Western Europeans went, um, it was like, oh, if you're not Christian, you're barbaric. <laughs> and that, that included a lot of brown folk. And so, um, and indigenous folks. So I, I think under, in some cases, even understanding some of that history contextually helps us understand uh, why uh, some of the things that we've always been taught and believed, even about Christianity. And you're like, oh, we think that way because what? Um, a lot of that learning is, is part of what is part of this transformative uh, community conferencing and moving it away from, you know, well, if you're white, then you are part of this problem, et cetera. And it's also a, a way to give um, us all an understanding of how we've all been harmed by this history. And it gives, you know, people of color have fatigue because <laughs> we're always the one to have to tell our stories, right? So, and that's hard and it's painful. It's true for indigenous people as well. It's hard, it's painful to always have to do that. And so I, I think this, you're exactly right. This is a different approach to it. And in doing so, it gets at more than just racism. It's more than just black and white. It's, it's a bigger story, a bigger thing that we have to dismantle. And, and really to ask ourselves, um, uh, the aha moment for me with David Anderson Hooker is he has a concept called fractal practice. And what that means is that in a large and diverse organization, um, think of a snowflake, right? Each, each snowflake is unique, but it's all, every last one is a snowflake, right? So there's some common elements in each snowflake that still make it a snowflake, even though they're all individual and distinct. There are some chemical and physical qualities that make a snowflake a snowflake. What are those things? And as disciples, even though we are geographically, racially, gender, politically, very diverse, what are those things that we want to say for ourselves as church that make us disciple? It's more than just having communion every Sunday, although there's 
some disciples congregations that don't have it. Part of our narrative is it's for me, I'm always saying it's not the frequency of communion that makes us disciple. It's the open access to the table. It's the theology that the table is open to all because it's Jesus's table. It's not our table. That's the theological grounding. Um, and so the narrative can't just be, um, we have communion every week if you like that. No, that's not what makes us disciple. It's the access to the table that we so firmly believe in that makes us disciple. So what are those other things theologically and practice that no matter where you might go, little uh, glimmers that you might see that say, oh, that group is like, they're one of those people, uh, not in an exclusive way, uh, but in a way that's very inclusive so that you might see uh, who we are and what we really believe, no matter where you are, there should be something that says these people are part of that church. So, um, but thank you, Jeff, for that question. And for the person who says, I want, this is the church I want to be a part of. I just preached a sermon at Chautauqua uh, Institution where I was um, week before last as the, uh, each of the denominational houses has a chaplain of the week, but I was the chaplain for the morning worship uh, on the main theater um, at Chautauqua. And I have a sermon called, I Want a Church. It's based on a Facebook post that I did in 2020 right after the George Floyd murder in the US. And it's, it's a series of statements that says, I want a church that loves in this way, uh, around justice, around inclusion, around faithfulness, around a lot of things. And so uh, I'm, I'm working with that outline, um, hopefully to, to, to uh, it's gonna show up in writing in some kind of way, I'm not sure how, but I'm glad somebody says, I want a church like that because I'm doing some working on, on that thing. I, this is the kind of church I want. So. Thank you. That was spirit affirming uh, that for me. Appreciate it. Thank you, Terry. I think Elizabeth, would you like to say something? Share something? You're you're muted right now, though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Um, uh, we had, yes. We did a study on listening to indigenous voices, and ah, uh, it was it's really a great study. And uh, it's. Um, so we, uh, as a church, did that, and the doctrine of discovery, and there's the links to everything in it from all yeah. parts of Canada, and uh, it was very, very helpful for us here in Nova Scotia, and I think that's, uh, oh. you know, one one of the, the paths that we have, and we also have the largest uh, Black population in Canada in Nova Scotia as well, so it's uh, okay. okay. well into trying to, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, allies and uh, to do we you know to learn as much as we can amen that's exciting i participated in a a caucus with the commissioners on the united church of canada's general council who are people of color and i intentionally participated in that um, because i i wanted to get um to hear from them as people of color, Caribbean and African descent and you know, lots of different places to hear from their Canadian context what it meant uh, for them to be black in Canada, uh, no matter where their ancestry was. And um, it was really, really, um, I won't just say informing, but um, affirming at the same time. And I think they were, um, they were glad to hear that a black woman in the U.S. like cared about what they thought. I'm like, we're we're in full communion. I said, um, my church has congregations in Canada. I want to learn as much as I can uh, about your experiences and what it's like to live as a person of color in Canada because it's something our whole church needs to respond to. So I'm so glad to hear um, of the work you guys. Canada is leading the way in terms of helping disciples in the U.S. really focus on. Um, as you say, listening and even learning about Indigenous voices, even getting into, it's, it's, been, it's been like developing a new muscle, even for us to, to get into the habit of doing like land acknowledgements, you know, that's, that's still something that we really have to be very intentional about, and we're trying to get better at like how we do it, but um, anti-racism, that stuff is, you know, Americans are going to talk about that sort of stuff, United States people are going to talk about that stuff. And um, it's, it's a growing edge for us. And um, I, I think we're together as this binational church 
uh, we have to live into the fullness of this, these two contexts in which we all live and serve. So thank you for, for that. And um, that's something we have to pay attention to with the Church Narrative Project is, is how do we ensure that we've got, um, that we're not leaving the indigenous um, issues uh, behind. Thank you. Because we, we've got, you know, all sorts of identities to work through. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Terry yeah. says in the chat, it's inspiring to learn the deep reflections and conversations taking place to help our church transform from colonialism towards understanding why that happened, but where we can grow in the US and Canada. Oh, great, great. Yeah. I... And, and then Darlene said she does have uh, information on the resources if anyone would like it and be in touch with Darlene. Uh, we have time for um, one more question or comment if, if you would like, and then we'll let Terry get back to her vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Only a few more days. Only a few. Floor. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Terry Horde Owens and everyone else who participated today. I just want to express that in my old age, I'm so excited with what's happening in the national church and in the regional church. This morning, we just uh, talked about a new model of being a church, of uh, uh, expressing our faith uh, in the community, not just uh, in the confines of uh, the building. And now with what uh, Reverend Terry shared with us, I think it's getting more and more exciting. So it's good to be in this uh, particular age in my life where there's excitement and, and joy and, and worthwhile activities happening. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Terry, for being here. Yes, we can give her a round of applause or use your little icons, whatever you like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we wish you every blessing and we are so grateful for the efforts that you do make um, to lift up the Canadian church um, within the context of the United States Indian church uh, and yes I always fly that flag and sometimes I march around with it and you know quite militantly but uh, you won't have to put up with me for no, a but, so that's <laughs> yeah. well I'm just saying that it's it's important that you do that because those of us with other identities have to wave other flags and so Right. It's so I don't I don't resent that at all. I, I'm grateful for it um, because it just reminds us that we just have to be diligent and faithful. And um, I, I must say, spending some time with the general counsel, it, I've engaged there because it's helping me get a different view of Canada. Right? It's um, there are different issues I'm I'm watching as people are discussing. Like one good example, capturing demographic information about clergy has apparently been a pretty controversial issue for them. In the United States, we give you 10 ways from Sunday to describe your identity. And, and we wear all of these, you know, I could have 16 banners uh, reflecting each part of myself and I'm really happy and proud about that. And it's just a very different uh, kind of concept. So um, they're learning, I think they will learn from this relationship with the disciples and um, we will learn a lot from them and, and continue to learn a lot from disciples in Canada. So thank you, Jen, for that. And thanks to all of you for this time. And um, wish I could have been with you in person, but i um, really grateful that you, yeah, that you wanted to hear from me and really grateful to hear such positive uh, feedback. And I hope some of you get to uh, participate in one of the upcoming town halls. Yes, there, I hope you can as well. There is in the chat a link to the Covenant Conversations, uh, the Covenant Project. In, there's a website link in the chat as well. Um, friends, I'm going to call this meeting fait accompli and, <laughs> um, and uh, give our blessings to Terry as you continue on. We are blessed by your ministry and have been over these last four years or more. Uh, and we look forward to being with you again another time. Okay. Friends, please let us yeah. show our appreciation in whatever possible way for Terry and Terry blessings to you as you continue your vacation. Thank uh, you. The link will be sent out tonight for the national worship service for tomorrow and uh, you're welcome to access at any time. So Okay, thank you, All everybody. Right. Take care, everybody.
Bye bye. Bye. Happy birthday to your aunt. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Thanks everybody for being here. Good to see everybody. Debbie. Is Debbie Weatherhead still there? No, she's gone. Oh. She's gone. Thank okay, you. Gonna... Thank you.